When Uncle Tom's Cabin was published in 1852, the anti-slavery novel flew off the shelves. 17 printing presses ran 24 hours a day to keep up with the demand, making it the best-selling novel of the 19th century. The book struck at our emotions as a nation, and it made us see ourselves. It was our emotional mirror, and it prompted some individuals to rethink how they thought of slavery. Uncle Tom's Cabin has been cited as a factor leading to the Civil War. When Abraham Lincoln later met the author, Harriet Beecher Stowe, he reportedly said, so you're the little woman who wrote the book that started this great war. In 1852, the backlash was immediate and powerful. In the South, the book was banned. And if you were caught selling the book, you were either going to be killed or thrown in prison. There was tremendous fear that this book would make a difference. It did by portraying Uncle Tom as a dignified, intelligent, God-fearing man. In the South, however, traveling Tom shows became popular, depicting him as a submissive buffoon, happy in his enslaved condition, a stereotype that still exists today. There were also attempts to discredit Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author countered with a key to Uncle Tom's Cabin, an exhaustive bibliography of the real people behind her fictional characters. It included her primary inspiration for Uncle Tom. Josiah Henson was an individual who demonstrated extraordinary courage. He tried to help other people, especially whites in this country, to understand the reality of slavery. Josiah Henson's story begins here in Rockville, Maryland, on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. Now, this suburban neighborhood was once a 570-acre plantation, and the house behind me is where the owner lived, a man named Isaac Riley. In this time period, masters wanted to present themselves to be very benevolent, these patriarchs who cared about their people that were enslaved, but the presentation that Henson gives us was that didn't happen for Isaac Riley. I faithfully served Raleigh for many years. He was coarse and vulgar in his habits, and unprincipled and cruel in his general deportment. Henson's autobiography provides many examples of Riley's cruelty, like the day he discovered a book on grammar hidden in nine-year-old Josiah's cap. When Riley saw the book, of course, he was outraged because it was unheard of that his enslaved people would learn to read and write. Pick up that book. He cried, using an awful oath. At last I was obliged to do it. When he beat me across the head and back till my eyes were swollen and I became unconscious. Despite the harsh treatment, Henson proved to be trustworthy. Eventually elevated to overseeing the plantation, he was able to ease the harsh conditions faced by his fellow slaves. When he was 18, he was even allowed to attend a revival meeting. Although not permitted to enter the church, he heard a life-changing message from preacher John McKinney. He said, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, tasted death for every man. It touched my heart, and I cried out, I wonder if Jesus Christ died for me. Again and again did the preacher reiterate the words, for every man. Oh, the blessedness and sweetness of feeling that I was loved. And that meant a lot to him because he knew that God would always be on his side. Um, he would deliver him and he would decide his plan in life. The plan included moving his family and 18 others to Isaac Riley's brother's home in Kentucky. When they got to Cincinnati, Henson found his faithfulness tested. Although Ohio was a free state and many free black men encouraged them to stay, he stood firm. He felt like he had been tasked with this duty and he was gonna fulfill it. He had taken care of them and they felt like if he wants us to carry along, we'll go with him. Henson came to regret that decision. Three years after their arrival in Kentucky, those who followed him were put up for auction. Husbands and wives, parents and children were to be separated forever. From that hour, I saw through hated and cursed the whole system of slavery. One absorbing purpose occupied my soul, to gain freedom, self-assertion, and deliverance from the cruel caprices and fortunes of dissolute tyrants. 
Because of Henson's management skills, he and his family were initially allowed to stay together. Two years later, however, his time had come. The only option, escape. A major obstacle was the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, which meant he and his family could be captured even in a free state. So he set his sights on Canada. It was a 600-mile journey that he would have to make on foot with his wife and four children, traveling by night, sleeping by day, super dangerous. But he knows he's got to go to Canada. It's the only place that he can truly be a free man. His wife made a sling for Josiah to carry the two youngest children on his back. With only the North Star as their guide, the Henson family began their journey. After 40 grueling days, they arrived at Lake Erie just across the water from Canada. A sympathetic ship captain offered to take them the rest of the way. He put his hand on my head and said, be a good fellow, won't you? I felt streams of emotion running down in electric courses from head to foot. Yes, said I, I'll use my freedom well. Henson helped start a black settlement in Ontario, including a multiracial school almost unheard of at the time. To raise money and awareness, he preached throughout the United States and England, where he was granted a private audience with Queen Victoria. During those years, he risked his life to help a total of 118 slaves reach freedom in Canada. He's an inspiration for me personally, and I hope for many people as they hear this story, to use our freedom well, right? To use our resources, our time, our money, our energy, our voice, our influence, to use it on behalf of those with less than us. Near the end of his life, Josiah Henson returned to the plantation he once managed. Although many of his experiences here were unimaginably painful, he could see God's hand in them. Later writing, sharp flashes of lightning come from black clouds. John Jessup, CBN News, reporting in Rockville, Maryland.